Conversations with the Citizen. I am your host, Tia Carol Jones. I'm here today with er Ernest Dawkins. Mr. Dawkins is a musician, composer, and educator. He is also the leader of Live the Spirit Big Band, as well as some other bands, right? Yes, yes. Yes, we're going to talk about all of that. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, let me um, point a clarification. I'm the executive director of Live the Spirit Residency, oh, which okay. is a 501c3 okay. that produces the Inglewood Jazz Festival okay. in our 23rd year. And it, as part of that, we has, have a residency band, which is Live the Spirit Big Band. And we have other um, items that we produce in relationship to our, our mission. Okay. We have the Young Masters. I gave you a CD. Yes. <clears throat> That's where I recruit some of the best and brightest young musicians to uh, mentor in terms of making a living at this music. And then we uh, have a senior band, and then we have free classes for youth. So that's pretty much our mission. <laughs> now about me. <laughs> Born and raised on the south side of Chicago, uh, as I was talking to you that um, a photographer for The Citizen, who was my African American studies teacher when I was graduated high school from Central YMCA. I went to CVS and uh, I cut a class, one class. And my father, I was on a Friday, he said, don't worry, you leave on Sunday. I said, what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Powhatan, Virginia, at the, at the only black military school in the nation. Oh, wow. So I stayed there for about a year and then I came back and I did my last few classes at Central Y, and that's why I ran into Mr. Lawson. So that's my relationship to the citizen. And uh, so I grew up on the South Side. Uh, I'd have had kind of dual um, residences because I was in Chatham, and I was also in Washington Park neighborhood because okay. my grandmother lived in Washington Park, and my mother lived in Chatham. So I went to Dixon which is out here, but okay. also graduated from Betsy Ross, which is on 59th and Wabash. Okay. So I was uh, kind of stayed in both places in terms of, because uh, I did sports out here, and then I would do different activities like music on, on um, where I lived on 60th in Michigan. So um, one of your questions is my earliest remembrance of music. Yes. I, don't, I don't have any specific memory, remembrance but you know when we were coming up the music was in the community okay. you know I would see professional musicians you know I'd be walking down the street and I would hear Anthony Braxton and Sonny Seals I don't know if you know who they are but they're like two of the top saxophonists in the world and they would be practicing together because they were married somehow someone someone married someone's uh, sister that kind of thing okay. so Blues guys were in the community. Uh, my gym teacher, Mr. Cox, he, uh, that tune they call it Mellow Gallo, he was in that, in, 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 in the relation, in playing in bands and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, Blues, 63rd Street was full of clubs, you know, 47th Street was full of clubs, 43rd Street was full, full of blues clubs. My father had an extensive record collection, <clears throat> thousands and thousands of records. And I would go listen to, I would just go put on a record, you know. And I, so I played. I wasn't into jazz, but I would listen to it and okay. I'd put it up because had, he had 33s, 78s, the whole nine yards. And so as I grew up, I knew about the music. Uh, my grandmother and them, they like Bill Doggett and all those kind of people. Uh, my my c cousin, who's like my sister, she, uh, her grandmother always played blues. You okay. know, her man was Bobby Blue Bland. Yeah. And okay. Stuff. Okay. So we got that. And then, of course, on Sundays, we always, you know, had the, the church. You could, hear, you, you could hear the choirs down the street, you know, walking, you know, you could hear the walk. The choir walking past the church. You stop there and listen to the choir if you didn't go to church that Sunday. But, um, I was always drawn to it. I don't know why. So at eight years old, I'll tell this incident on the air. 
and I tell this to a lot of my students, but don't do what I did. Uh, my people would send me to, to Sunday school and I would take my money. I lived on 60th in Michigan. I would take the Jitney, I'm sure my age, down <laughs> to the Regal on okay. 47th Street. I'd be dressed in my sh shirt and tie and all the guys would be hanging out with their do-rags. <laughs> they wouldn't bother me. They would, I don't know why. I would always get a pass and I'd go into the Regal and I'd see some of the greatest shows, you know. i see the Motown Review, you know, and if you know who's on the Motown Review, <laughs> Four Tops, right. Little Stevie Wonder, Martha Reese and the Vandella, the Supremes, Smokey, Temptations, um, Isley Brothers was on Motown at that time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these great bands for whatever I paid for it, you know, and I'd come home and they say, how was the sermon? I'm, oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I was the kind of kid that if I did something like that, I would pick my time, you know, and, um, and I would do it just like in high school. Like I said, I took one time and I, and I cut class and my father said, you're out, <laughs> mm. ship me out of here. So, uh, but anyway, those kind of experiences were my introduction into the into the music because it was communal, okay. it was family related, it okay. was community related, it was uh, something that was accessible to us. We didn't have to pay, you know, two hundred dollars to go to a show out in Orland Park or something, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So, in in a lot of ways, you know, the community has digressed in mm -hmm. relationship to arts, and uh, I think there's a certain parallel with the spike in violence in the whole nine yards, but that's that's another that's another story. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. When did you start playing the saxophone? I didn't start playing the saxophone until I got out of high school. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I played bass when I was eight. Oh, I would go down the line okay. at Healy. I would take the L because I was living in Chatham. <laughs> I would take the train all the way down the line Healy. I'd take the bus and the train by myself. I was a latchkey kid. At eight years old? At eight years old, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would go downtown and take my lesson and come back. You know, my people, you know, my, my father, he worked all the time. He was a, he worked two, three jobs. You know, he was like, he was he was a hustler too and working. <laughs> and he parlayed that into real estate. Mm -hmm. And my mother worked, so uh, during the day, I would do, you know, do what I needed to do. Go, go downtown, take my lesson. Then sometimes I wouldn't come home or go to my grandmother's house, that kind of thing. But I was independent as a young child, you know. So I took, uh, then I started playing percussion when I was kind of like 15, 16 years old. Uh -huh. I started playing like hand percussion and rock bands. And that was, most of that activity was up north, okay. you know, particularly at that time. Because most of your rock groups, you know, weren't, weren't many black rock groups. Right. So we had to incorporated into some white, white groups, but we played, and then after that, um, some guys moved on my block. I was on 60th in Michigan, they moved on my block, and uh, it was right after I graduated high school, I always had a job, because I, you know, I like to dress and stuff. My father would say, okay, that's cool, but you buy your own clothes, <laughs> and I would raise my money to buy my own, you know, clothes, because back then, you know, we wore knit shirts and, you know, silk and wool pants, you know, cashmere coats, we didn't, we didn't dress in blue jeans. And yeah, that wasn't cheap. Right, no. <laughs> and blue jeans was like, that was for going outside, that was, that was, you know, that was, those were poor clothes <laughs> in relationship to what we like to dress in. But anyway, so, um, these guys moved on my block, and I heard them play. And like I said, I had my father had that extensive record collection, and I heard a guy. He sounded just like Charlie Parker. Okay. And I had an epiphany. I said, "That's me." Mm -hmm. And the next day, I went and bought me a saxophone. Wow. Mm -hmm. Within a week, I had a saxophone, clarinet, and flute. That was like June, something like that, July. By August, I was uh, enrolled in Vandercook School of Music. Because okay. I had a little background into music, and then I would ask them, ask the guys that moved on my block certain tips and learn my scales, 
learn kind of kind of like halfway to read, you know, basic music, and I was enrolled in the Vanderbilt School of Music, and kind of the rest of this history. And then by that time, my people they said, "Okay, you played bass when you were eight, you played percussion when you were a teenager. Now you're in the late teens, and you want to pick up this instrument." They said, "You can, but." won't practice in my house. Mm, okay. So I'd have to go to Washington Park every day to practice. Every day I went. Either I went to um, Washington Park or if it rained, I went to my friend's house. His name was Thomas Ball. And they had a house house. Okay. They were in an apartment. So he had like the whole second floor. So we would go up there and practice. Or even when he wasn't there, you know, we were so familiar with the family that they would let me in and I would practice up there, that kind of thing. So I went to practice every day. And uh, one day I was practicing out in Washington Park and this guy said, you know, you need to go to the AACM School of Music. I said, the AACM School of Music, that's the t-shirt I have on because the lady didn't have the shirt. <laughs> uh, that's another story. But anyway, so the AACM School of Music, I said, AACM School of Music, what is that? He said, you just need to go. I said, okay. And I went to the ATM School of Music. They were right down on 87, uh, Child City. You know what Child City was? Yeah. Child City was one block west of uh, Jeffrey. Okay. Was that Euclid? I forgot the name of the street, but it was right there. Right there on 80, it's the 87 block. That's where it was. Okay. Okay. And it's kind of like a child development center, but that's where the ATM had their classes on Saturday. So I went in there. And they, they had some of the greatest uh, saxophone players that were teaching me my first lesson. They had me trying to play this difficult song, and I was I was butchering the song. And I said, don't worry, I'll be back. I was like Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. So I just kept coming back, I kept coming back, then I kept going to the classes, and I became a member. So it's kind of parallel that I uh, received a training institutionally from the university and from the community at the oh, same okay. time. And I always uh, am a proponent of that because this music is transmitted through people. It's not transmitted through uh, certain kind of ways of teaching it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something you have to experience. It's almost like your baptism. You have to get into the water to do it. And then as you go, you get better as you incorporate different tools and techniques. Oh my gosh, because this is, uh, we call it hip, highly, it's, it's from highly intelligent people, you know. <laughs> and it's a highly intelligent art form that's communicated non-verbally and uh, telepathically almost through the uh, ethos and you have to learn the language and you have to learn how to communicate and you have to learn how to make music with so that's it's a it's a process. Yeah. So you know nowadays a lot of guys are learning it through the schools, but they're not learning how to make music okay. because they haven't been put in those kind of situations. So um, I said that to say is that I've sat next to like some of the greatest players in the world in big bands, and that's how the music is taught to you because you hear him bending a certain note, putting a certain term on certain thing, and you'd be like, oh, that's how you do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. to attempt to mimic that, and, and, and uh, you learn the language from there. So, I'm, so that's how, you know, that happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It, it, like I said before, you've been the leader of a few ensemble bands. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about the Live the Spirit residency and then um, how it began and what mm. you have coming up? Okay. So, um, of course, I was, like I said, I was a member of the ACM, but I wanted to start, uh, I get, but actually I got this grant from new residencies out of New York and the grant was in relationship to you could use this money. I forgot it was like two hundred thousand dollars. It was a big grant. Um, I forgot exactly how. You could use this money to do any kind of project that you want to set up. 
and I thought about it, and I thought about the future. I said, I'm going to set up some communal structures related to the arts that will become institutions because that's why I got into the ACM. So I had to have partners. I had Muntu Dance Theater at the Community Film Workshop, and I had a Museum of Contemporary Art as my partners. So we started a Jazz Fest in whatever, 2099. Uh, we started the Little Spirit Big Band as the residency band oh. related to that. And that's where I start recruiting young musicians to come into to the band. And um, and we paid them. Okay. That's another thing is I am a, am a believer of paying the artists because they have to make a living at what they do. Right. That's the art world won't be continued. So we paid these young guys. I set up a big band and out of this band came, you know, you know anything about Chicago jazz scene? Not really. Young guy. So <laughs> Nicole Mitchell was in the band. She's like the top flautist, jazz flautist or contemporary jazz musician in the in the world, female. Um uh, Marquise Hill came out of it. Marquise Hill has played with you know, a lot of people, uh, Maurice Brown, he's playing with all the hip hop cats. And he's doing arrangements, he's all over the world. You have other guys like Junius Paul, Makaya McCraven was kind of, he's been associated in the circles. Greg Ward, he was in the band, he's playing at Symphony Center tonight uh, as part of that program. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the Collier boys, they're younger, in early 20s, they came out of Lexus Lombre. She came out of the program. And I have younger people that's <laughs> coming in the program, in the program as well. But I said that to say is that, so most of the people um, in relationship to the Southside community, and then you had a great uh, teacher over here at Dixon, okay. in Diane Ellis, and she, She's the one that taught a lot of these young musicians that are out here professing, you know, and they were like, she was like a feeder bad for me. Okay. And I got those guys and girls and women. So anyway, um, so that's the big band. A lot of uh, the best and brightest young musicians have come out of that situation. You know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm, I did it mainly for, for black black musicians, really, okay. because okay. our opportunity is limited, and there's really not that many young blacks that are playing this music. You know, I see a lot of young whites playing music. I went down to the Jazz Institute jam session last night, and it was all white. Mm -hmm. I saw one young cat came in there, black. He was 12. His father brought him with his family. And I looked at him when he came. I sat at the door with him because I know the guy that runs the program. I sat at the door. I'm like, look at this. He came in with his drumsticks. I said, like, okay. His father said, he's not going to play. In my mind, I said, he just don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the last tune they, they were playing, I told the director. Yeah, yeah, actually, he came through the program too, John, because John is the director of the Jazz Links program at uh, – at the Jazz Institute. I took him over to Europe, you know, and that's part of it too. We take these guys out to Europe their first time, that kind of thing, and get them, get them uh, adjusted to uh, that kind of situation where they're traveling and making money. So anyway, um, I said, uh, yeah, that guy, that young guy, get him up there to play, man. He said, well, he might not play. I said, look, man, he, he bold enough to come in here with his sticks out. He bold enough to step on that stage. So right. sure enough, they got him up. And he played. I said, there you go. You know. And it wasn't a thing where, you know, you muscled him or anything. You just gave him an opportunity. And he right. seized the moment. And he was pretty good. I could see his talent. And that's one of my gifts. I could see talent. You know, so. Uh, that's one of my downfalls, too. Because <laughs> sometimes I push him too hard. Okay. Some people can't take pushing. You know, they can't take being push that hard, you know, but uh, I take them to the brink, and some people, like, you know, they, they, they can't take it, they push back, and that's cool, too, just as long as they understand 
what it's about. But some people, when you push them, they don't understand because they get wrapped up in their emotions. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand that. But anyway, that's one of my gifts I can uh, relate to Tyler. So anyway, the Little Spirit Residency is a 501c3. Like I said, our programs, our Live the Spirit Residency, we do the uh, Inglewood Jazz Fest, which is in its 23rd year. We're going to at least do three, three days this year, the third week of September. Um, we do the Young Masters program. That's where we, you know, we recruit the young guys to come in and play and compose. Okay. Because composition is a key part of uh, making your living. Certain guys that came out of the program, they realized that and they're doing really good because they wrote their own music mm. and they're arranging other people's music. So they're getting the residuals from their music. So they're doing really, really well. You know, they're buying their mother's houses off music, mm. not being a ball player. You see what I'm saying? So it, it can be done, but it's how you do it. And it takes a lot of work and it's strategic kind of situations that you have to put your self in and you have to have a goal of what you want to accomplish. It's just like any other business. Set yourself a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. What do you want to do next year? How many CDs do you want to have out by next year? If you average one a year and you're 20, by the time you're 40, you have 20, right? right? And usually if you get one a year, you're going to be doing at least two, three, four, five a year. You see what I'm saying? So some of these gaps some of these cats, some of these people, guys, <laughs> and women have discographies now, 20 and 30 CDs, and they're in their 20s. Right. You see, so by the time they're 50, 60, they have this long discography, and hopefully they get the residuals from the right. discography. That's a whole other issue. That's a whole... Um, but they'll be known for their discography, and they'll always have some things that they can play. And then when you get to that age and you have big gigs and you plan at whatever symphony center, then you get paid for those, um, you get paid those residuals to play those situations. So, uh, so, and then we do youth uh, lessons for, you know, uh, the community, particularly we are in partnership at Hamilton Park. And um, that's it, the Jazz Festival, Young Masters. Oh, and we do a senior band. We do a senior, but we, uh, er and everything is free that we do. I make sure, we make sure that everything is free. It's free to the community. Um, and we do a senior, senior situation where we have seniors come in and play. So that's pretty much what we offer. And then now we're going to try to do more things. We have like 30 events this summer. Um, we have something coming up on April 1st where I wrote this, uh, well, Yep, April 1st is our first thing coming up for this session. Okay. Uh, we're doing a thing called Refound Connections. It's a piece that I was uh, commissioned to write from South Arts Organization in Atlanta. Okay. And um, it's a relationship to my reconnecting with my Southern roots because when I was young, because of Emmett Till, we couldn't go down South. Okay. So I never really met my Southern relatives. <clears throat> I, when I was playing, I go down. We call it the chilling circuit, you know. I'm right. down there with whatever Gene Chandler or somebody. We usually going in. We doing one hit, then we going to the next town. We going to the next town, that kind of thing. So, never got a chance to meet my people. So this piece is supposed to be a symbolic representation of me reconnecting with my southern roots and my southern heritage. Right. So we performed it in Durham a couple of weeks ago. And uh, now we're going to perform it April 1st at Hamilton Park, 513 West 72nd Street. And I'm bringing in uh, two musicians from Durham, North Carolina. We use two musicians there, and I'm bringing them here. Well, we're bringing him here because the organization is bringing them right. here. Right. Uh, so we're bringing them here, and we're going to play uh, the piece at Hamilton Park, 6 o'clock. See there, I knew it. <laughs> this thing. Sorry. Um, turn off the... so, um, so anyway, what else? Uh, after that, on the 8th, we have a, a city concert that we have to do because we're doing this series of, we have all these events. We're doing drum circles. We're doing city concerts. 
the whole nine yards. Um, and we do things with Jazz Fest, so we counted like 30 events. And we also doing streaming events. During the pandemic, we set up our streaming studio, so we're doing live streams. And then we're going to post produce a live stream. So that's the first thing, April 1st. The next thing, April 2nd, we're going to do a session with Isaiah Collier. Isaiah Collier, actually, he he's, lives around 75th in Indiana. Okay. So it's not far from here okay. uh, in, in Chatham. And he's one of the people that came through the program to set up service. So we're going to do a streaming live stream with him on April 2nd. And then April 8th, we're doing another concert in the parks at Lumbloom Park. We'll be featuring a, actually a resident from around this way, Aubrey Brown. And he's going to be our featured guest with the Young Masters. So, and then as the summer comes up, we're doing, uh, we'll do drum circles the whole nine yards. So we'll pretty much do a drum circle each Saturday somewhere in Inglewood or South Shore the whole nine yards. And then I have a personal gig on March 18th okay. for women only. Okay. Sorry, Callie. That's at that's at the court at the quarry, which is on the 75th. Mm. Oh and, yeah, okay. Yeah, I know where it is, right? Yates, 75th and Yates. Right. So we're doing that. Um, I don't know what time that starts. So that's that's coming up. And then I'm doing something at uh, got it. The cafe, the Astor Gates Cafe, on, oh, on, Gar um, on Garfield, on right, the retreat, right. on the thirty first with D. Alexander and some of the young guys. And I, actually, I'm gonna bring in uh, the drummer that's playing with us April first. He's never played this kind of music because this will be improvisational music. Okay. So. And that's another thing is that I like all kind of music. Okay. I don't, you know, I'm too, I'm too out for the straight ahead. I'm, too straight ahead for the out people. <laughs> okay. I'm too contemporary for, you know, that kind of thing. So I like all, uh, I, I gravitate towards all kinds of music. That's why I like young people, they because they keep me up to date in the latest kind of thing, things that are happening and they keep your energy flowing and your ideas flowing. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on. Then I got another commission that's <laughs> coming up. Yeah, I'm, I'm busy. Yeah, so I, I, I was uh, lucky enough to do a thing for Frederick Douglass last year. That was from uh, Chamber of Music America. And we just got the grant yesterday. We're going to perform it in, in uh, England okay. in July, oh, which okay. is interesting. We're going up to Newcastle because people don't realize that Frederick Douglass had a strong relationship with England and particularly Newcastle, okay. the University of Newcastle. And if you know anything about England, that's like, the Blue Hills of Kentucky, mm -hmm. because that's where all the coal miners were. So it was really like um, interesting to say the least to have a black man, particularly an abolitionist and a slave in Newcastle during that time. Okay. And he toured all over Ireland and um, gave lectures. And unbeknownst to him, when he returned to the States, they bought his freedom. Okay. Right, so they just built a new building in his honor and a new statue in his honor at the University of Newcastle. And we were supposed to perform this piece like two years ago, then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So looks like we'll finally get a chance to perform the piece in uh, Newcastle. So we just got that, that grant yesterday. So we'll be going to Newcastle in the summer as well. So, um, so that's... Oh, so I was talking about the new commission. So that was through uh, Chamber of Music America. The one, the one newfound connect, connections that we're doing April 1st, that was through South Arts again. Okay. And then the last one, not least, not least but last, is through the uh, <clears throat> Jazz Institute Chicago, and it's for Tim Yule Black. Okay. Do you know Tim Yule Black? Yeah. So uh, they commissioned, uh, I think, three or four musicians to write pieces in his honor. So I'm one of the musicians to write the piece, and we'll, we'll be doing that at the end of May. Okay. So it's a busy period. Yes. Man, man. You have a lot going on. <laughs> it's capacity. <Oof. laughs> so you can donate. <laughs> Go to livethespiritresidency.org. 
and donate because we need some capacity. <laughs> um, what advice would you mm. give parents whose children might have some musical ability? Oh, that's a good. That's a good. One. Well, you have to encourage them, <clears throat> and you have to put them in a situation to succeed. Like I was just telling you about the little guy right. that his father brought him down there. So his father took out. He took. He brought the whole family. It was two other smaller children with them. So he had three children and his wife. He brought his whole wife to his whole family to the jam session. So therefore the kid had a insulation right there. So right. he felt comfortable and because his his all of his peers with all of his siblings were there, right. his mother was there to encourage him. So you have to be nurturing and you have to put him in situations. Um, and those situations can be lessons. It can be taking them to a jam session at an early age, okay. you know. And see, my father messed up when I, I remember when I was three years old, he would take me to the Regal and I would see Count Basie and Duke Ellington and stuff. So he didn't know subliminally he was messing me up. <laughs> he wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> but I am a doctor. I'm a, I'm a scientist of sound. Okay. You know, so. okay. <laughs> there you go. So I, I would say, <clears throat> get them the lessons, you know, choose whoever's teaching your ch child, choose them wisely and make sure they meet the goals that you want to accomplish. Because music is, everybody's not going to be a professional mu musician, but you'll know if that kid has I'm not sure about that. extremely, extremely good talent. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these smart falls, they're too smart for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I'm sure about it. <laughs> right. So yeah. uh, get them involved, get them early as possible. Um, you know, get them in lessons, but it's proven that everyone that has a musical background usually is successful in their um, later years in relationship to their careers, and particularly math and sciences. So that's been proven. So that's why in uh, what we call the olden days in the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a piano in their house because it, it stimulates different synapses in, yeah. our, in our mind different parts of our brain in relationship to creativity and, and problem solving. And like I said, I'm a firm believer in that there's a, there's a strict coalition in the disappearance of music in our schools and the violence in our community. Because when, when the music started disappearing, that's when all this other stuff took over, you know. Uh, and there's a, like I said, the guy John, we were talking today, he's the head of the uh, Jazz Links jazz jam program, jazz links, jazz jam. Uh, he was telling me there's a new study out that says that there's no music in the schools and most of the music is not, you know, most black schools don't have music. They don't have art and they don't have music. So you have no, you have no way between, and that's why athletics became so popular because you didn't have the different outlet for the youth to express themselves. So now our leaders are ball players. You know what I'm saying? They they set the trends. Okay. They set the standards. Because um, if they see the ball player wearing a certain gym shoes, certain kind of whatever um, pants, they want it. You know that kind of kind of thing. So, and back in the day, the musicians set the trends. Okay. You know, part of the, part of it was that the musicians set the trends. Uh, so. I'm a firm believer that we need to support the arts. And every time I see things in relationship to our communities, I don't, I don't see art. When Channel 2 do something, very seldom do I see them, like what you're doing. You, you know, you're interviewing an artist in relationship to institutions in our community. I don't see that, you know. Uh, and that's very important because children need to see that. They need to see that they can be successful. That's why that's why I started the mentoring program. Because when you know when you when you in this music, you be like, well, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna make a living at this stuff? How you know? And it's more than just playing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, a lot more than just playing. Most guys think that you know you you, you play a good solo and then that's gonna get you over, but not necessarily. You have to have a 
some other things that go along with that. And they have to be some strategic things that you put in place to benefit from what you do. Because I've seen guys that have been good players, but their careers are not, you know, what they should be because of because of decisions that they made in relationship to, to their to their careers, you know, and um, they're doing good, but they could do, you know, you could see where there's a possibility that they could be doing much much better in relationship to certain choices, you know, what they do. Like I said, part of it's having your own product. Your own product is your own music, your own compositions. You have to have your book. Because a blue note comes to me now and asks to record me. And I say, oh, oh I'm going to do Miles Davis stuff. Okay. But I don't get the residuals from that. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm known as somebody that plays Miles Davis music. And, and interpreters, and you can interpret it well, but you don't. You don't have a. You don't put a stamp on the music in terms of creating your own sound. Sound because the the, the thing with the with jazz is that your composition usually follows your trajectory in terms of your relationship in terms of improvisation, okay. and what you what you bring to that improvisation. So are you furthering the the genre? You know. Because your compositions will help you further. That's that's what Miles Davis was known for. Because he was changing all the time, mm -hmm. and he wasn't staying in one thing. So that led to certain things, of kind of propelling the music in different in different directions, and putting a stamp on it and made it. And he made it um, um, a name and made a brand, and name and made several different styles. You know, John. So I say that the compositions are, are parallels of people's development, and particularly to improvisation and their own personal development, and their own personal journey. Because if you look at those uh, discographies, they're like eight years long, and they did all this work in eight years. Whatever these hundreds and hundreds of albums in eight years, I'm like, whoa. So. That that part of the business has changed, but you still have to have that kind of outlook, and it has to be more well, long term, thirty years, forty years. You know, what you do now is going to reflect on what you're doing in forty years, and you know, musicians don't have uh, IRAs, right. <laughs> so you you have to have those kind of strategies going on too. You know, because. Uh, there's some young guys out here that have their heads on straight. They they getting into uh, Bitcoin. They they I see guys that's uh, during the uh, pandemic they were uh, investing in different opportunities. You know, so because they realize that you can't, you might not be able to play all the time live. So what? How are you gonna make a living? You know. So that's why. Again, I'm rambling, but that's why we built the streaming studio because. That's going to be the next thing, like what you're doing now. This is the next um, development <clears throat> in the art, in, in communications, and in, in what we do, and how we get the word out to people. And um, you have to you have to go along with the times. You have to go along with the technology. Technology is there. So we, if we as musicians, we don't want to get into this technology, but we have to take advantage of it. We have to establish our share in the marketplace. And particularly in Chicago, because Chicago has has always had a particular space in relationship to the music, because it's it sounds different, it comes from a different place, it comes from a different earthiness. So the Chicago sound is a valuable sound in relationship to the overall sound of what we call jazz, or impro improvised music, or creative music, or even blues, because this is the home of the blues, it's the home of the gospel. You see what I'm saying? So Chicago has a predominant, important place in relationship to the arts, too. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point to, to end on. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you very much. We have to do this again. We have to do it strategically, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Remember to make plans to join us again next week.
conversations with the citizen, the place where real news